The issues that Adorado will be speaking about tonight affect us all, whether directly or indirectly. Her strength, I believe, lies in the way that she ties all of the issues about that we care about together so we can see how everyone and everything is interconnected. It's impossible for us to talk about poverty without discussing trade issues. It's impossible to talk about trade without addressing agriculture. And unfortunately, it's become impossible to talk about agriculture or food without talking about genetic engineering and patents on life. And as Adorada pointed out last night on the Portland Community Media Show, A Growing Concern, food is very personal. However, it's also become very political for all of the reasons that she will be talking about this evening. <clears throat> Your being here today is a very important step in changing the conversation that needs to happen about genetically engineered foods. Knowledge is power, and we at Northwest Rage realize every day how little people know about genetically engineered foods and how angry they become whenever they realize that we've been guinea pigs in a worldwide experiment. With the knowledge that you take today, please let at least one other person know about uh, what, you've, what you learned tonight. And if you want more action after this evening is over, please contact Northwest Rage, and we'll show you what you can do to help stop genetic engineering and patents on life. Without further ado, Adorada Mitchell. So yeah, I know it's a Saturday evening and it's raining, and I'm a real wimp when it comes to Saturday evenings and rainy nights. So thank you so much for being here. Um, I got here last evening, and I have to say, I'm incredibly touched and so honored. So I want to just thank everyone who is associated with Northwest Rage in any way. If you would please stand up. Anyone who has to do with Northwest Rage, please. You know, in my work, I'm very fortunate. I get to work with farmers' movements around the world. I've been in. Senegal working with farmers there in Mozambique or in India. And every time the resistance to the corporate control of a food system, when they hear about opposition in the United States, they are so grateful because they recognize people in the United States are fighting the battle in the belly of the beast. So Northwest Rage, you are amazing. You're an inspiration. And I'm deeply honored. And so I hope all of us here this evening is about it, supporting Northwest Rage because this is really about protecting a food system. So I'm going to only ask one thing of you this evening. Please make your commitment to Northwest Rage. We need that. So having said that, um, my talk this evening is focusing on the myths of genetic engineering. And before I start that, I did write out my talk. I still very often think in Hindi, which is my mother tongue. So sometimes I get all confused because there's so much to talk about. So I did write it out, and I'll try not to kind of read it. But if you go to Monsanto's web page, and in fact the home page, it has a press release from January 18th. And the press release is from International Service for the Acquisition of Agribiotech Applications. This is supposed to be a nonprofit funded by Syngenta, Monsanto, Bayer, and also by the Rockefeller Foundation, by the way. The press release is boasting that the global biotech area surges past 250 million acres. They're celebrating the fact, and they're saying that over 252 million acres of land is under cultivation of GE crops. Clive James, founder and executive director of ISA, and the author of the report, he claims I quote him, more than 90% or 9.3 million farmers growing biotech crops were small, resource-poor farmers from the developing world, allowing biotechnology to contribute to the alleviation of their poverty. So once again, biotechnology is alleviating poverty for the third world farmers. The press release then quotes Ravindra Barar, supposedly a widowed mother of two, a biotech cotton farmer in India. And she's quoted as, developing world farmers need the increased production and income biotech crops offer, as well as the environmental and time benefits. My biotech crops have reduced spraying cost, and they have resulted in higher yields. And then the press release goes on to talk about the success of BT cotton in India and how it has helped improve the national income 
which has then trickled down to the farmers, and it's one wonderful you know, fairy tale in India. Now, all these press releases and the images that I showed to you, they fit in very well with the industry's public relations exercise. The key arguments that are used in pro-industry blitz are greenwashing. Biotech will create a world free of pesticides. They're wonderful for the farmers. And poor washing, we must accept genetic engineering if we want to eradicate hunger, if we want to alleviate people out of poverty, if we want to reduce the cost of production, if we want to improve livelihoods of farmers. And anyone who stands up in opposition is basically nothing else but some well-fed uh, European or American who's trying to deny third world countries of these benefits. However, if you look at the evidence and real life experience, you realize that Monsanto's claims are nothing else but spurious suggestions. Over the last two years, while working with some of the largest farmers' unions in India, they represent nearly 600 to 700 million farmers. I had the opportunity to spend a lot of time in India, but also with really with the farmers. And I traveled to Vidharbha in Maharashtra, which is the cotton belt in my country. There I met the family of Ramesh Rathor. Ramesh was from the village of Bondhgavan in Vidarbha. He took his own life in 2005. He had bought Bolgren brand MEC 162 variety for $36 per 450 grams, compared with the $9 that farmers pay for non-BT seeds. And his hopes were completely dashed when his crop was uh, attacked by pests. And at the same time, the leaves of the cotton plant turned red before drying up. He again took loans so he could spray more pesticides on his crops. But when he had taken tons of money and there was no improvement, he consumed the same pesticide that he had bought to deal with his crops. Left behind was Dharmi Bhai, his young widow, who had to shoulder the responsibility of the whole family. And she spent money on buying two very expensive pesticides, endosulfane and tracer, against the bullworm pest but their three acres of land did not even produce three quintals of cotton. I also met the family of 34-year-old Chandrakrant Grunel from the village of Yavatmal, which has been, again, lots in the news in Vidharbha because many cotton farmers from Yavatmal have taken their own lives. He committed suicide in April 2006. He too had bought the genetically modified cotton seeds for his six-hectare farm and he saw his crops fail for two successive years. There was no hope left. He had sold off the oxen that he used to plow his fields with. Wife's wedding jewelry had been pawned off. He poured kerosene on himself, and he set himself on fire. So actually, when I meet industry people who say, well, we have never seen anyone die out of GE um, crops, I actually tell them, I have seen those people. Yes, my country has lost a lot of farmers who have taken their own lives because of genetic engineering. I learned about many farmers like Chandrakant and Ramesh in Vidarbha. Vidarbha, between, where between June 2005 and August 2006, an estimated 700 cotton farmers have taken their own lives. And Monsanto has the audacity to put a press release on their homepage talking about how BT cotton has revolutionized countryside in India. So while Monsanto's studies hail the success of BT cotton in India, travels of Indian farmers have been continuing. Devastated by the bullworm pest, BT crops have been attacked by lalia, which is the disease I mentioned when the leaves turn red before drying up. And it is a disease which has been unseen before, um, before uh, BT cotton had arrived in India, and it affects BT cotton much more than the non-BT crops. And the studies done in India show that farmers are spending as much as $136 per acre compared to $11 per acre that are spent on non-BT cotton crops because GE cotton requires more insecticidal sprays. Now, this failure of GE cotton in India resulted in the Genetic Engineering Approval Committee, which is a body of the central government. Uh, they banned several varieties of Monsanto's cotton in Andhra Pradesh, with a, which is a state in the south of India. And MEC-12, one of its uh, varieties, has been banned all over southern India. Warangal, which is uh, in Andhra Pradesh, 
is demanding that Monsanto pay compensation to farmers for their losses because they spent so much money buying these expensive seeds, then they spent money buying all these pesticides, so they want them to pay compensation. At the same time, the government of Andhra Pradesh, backed by the central government of India, is challenging Monsanto and took Monsanto under the Monopolies and Restrictive Trade Practices Commission for hugely overcharging farmers. So, so much about Monsanto being dedicated to bringing relief to the farmers of third world countries. But then my country, India, is not alone. A study which was the first to look at the long-term economic impact of Bt cotton by some researchers from Cornell University, which was headed by Pinstrup Anderson. Some of you might know him. He's the former head of IFPRI, who once told me his dream, his vision was to see a tomato which was labeled organic and genetically engineered. So the study that he conducted found in China, which was a country where farmers were one of the first people to adopt Bt cotton, that after seven years of cultivation, they had to spray up to 20 times in a growing season to deal with secondary insects, which were resulting in a net average income of 8% less than conventional cotton growers. So after seven years, their profits have gone down, and even a study headed by the former head of IFPRI is coughing up to that fact. And yet in the face of this growing evidence from around the world, that small farmers are the ones who have borne the brunt of Bt cotton, biotech industry and its researchers, they continue to spin GE crops as the only way to improve livelihoods of farmers, as the only way to ensure food security. You know, over and over again, we have been told biotechnology is, is the only way or the only hope that we have of feeding a growing world population. Again, Monsanto's website, I quote them, it says, given expected population growth during the next 20 years, the per acre productivity of land currently under cultivation will need to increase by as much as 75%. We are using a variety of technology tools plant biotechnology, genomics, molecular breeding, so we can create a full pipeline of products designed to make farmers more productive. So again, they're being driven by this good intentions of feeding the world. Now, the truth is that if the corporations like Monsanto were indeed committed to eradicating hunger, instead of these corporate PR campaigns which suggest that poor will benefit from this technology, they would acknowledge that we all live with the paradox of hunger amidst plenty. Our research at the Oakland Institute clearly shows that we have enough food to provide over 2,720 kilocalories per person per day around the world. We all know that it's not a problem of production, or else USDA would not say that 37 million Americans live in food insecure households. You would not have hunger in supposedly the richest nation on earth if it was just about shortage of food production. We know it is about the shortage of purchasing power. We know there is no technological fix to hunger. Yes, we do need living wage jobs. We need land reform. We need farmers' rights to land, water, and seeds if we are going to deal with hunger. My own country, India, is home to 50% of the world's hungry population nearly 350 million people who live on less than a dollar a day are considered food secure in my country, which is the third largest producer of food in the world. Something that many of you might not know. Yes, we are the third largest spender on defense in the world as well after US and China, but we are the third largest producer of food in the world. In 2000, the food uh, granaries of the Food Corporation of India were overflowing with over 80 million tons of excess grains, while starvation deaths were reported from all over the country. Each year, while millions of food rot in the granaries of the Food Corporation of India, when the government of India contemplates dumping that food in the sea because it cannot find a market, an export market, as it has been told to do, or rats get into that food, millions of Indians starve to death. And we face the pressure from Catholic Relief Services. We face the pressure from USAID to accept genetically modified food aid. Hunger in the third world is a very complex phenomenon, and it cannot be challenged by genetically engineered crops. 
almost 78% of countries that report child malnutrition, countries like Ethiopia, countries like Niger, Malawi, which get into the news because they're looking for food aid, are food exporting countries. In 2005, while Niger was reeling from one of the worst famines, when over 230,000 children were in the emergency nutritional camps of Doctors Without Borders, Niger was exporting food to Nigeria. So hunger has nothing to do with some deficit of food production. It's really about people's poverty. So given the state of affairs, social morality would actually demand that the industry and corporations like Monsanto give a better rationale for the promotion of their crops rather than hunger. And downstairs, we have some reports from the Institute. One is Sahel, a prisoner of starvation, where the UN estimates nearly 300,000 children are threatened from uh, death because of hunger-related causes. And this report looks at the true causes of hunger and the solutions for it. So if you're interested, please get yourself a copy of that. And Food Aid or Food Sovereignty, they're available downstairs. And I will not say that I come from a country where food is sacred. I think food is sacred for all of us. Food is about feeding our families and about our communities. I think of Thanksgiving in this country. I think of almost every culture, every country has some festival, some um, you know, kind of uh, an, uh, uh, different occasions throughout the year that bring communities together. And it's about food, I mean, dinners that we all hope for, you know, which bring families together. And yet, what has happened to our food system? In the United States, since the advent of commercial production of GE crops in 96, it is estimated that more than 100 million acres of GE crops have been planted. It is estimated that without our approval, without us asking for it, nearly 60% of processed foods in our market shelves and supermarkets, from soda to crackers to infant formula to condiments, they contain genetically modified organisms. 52% of corn, 87% of all soy, 55% of canola, and 79% of cotton that is grown in the United States is today genetically engineered. But the food that we eat is conditioned by a social, cultural, religious context. I'm a Hindu. Eating beef for me is sacrilegious. I mean, I can't do it. I'm also a vegetarian. But by transferring genes from one organism to another, that cannot happen by nature. Suddenly, we have those products out there. Biotechnologists have engineered novel creations, such as potatoes with bacteria genes. Think of that, potatoes with bacteria genes. Super pigs with human genes, human growth genes. Fish with cattle growth genes. Tomatoes with flounder genes. And thousands of other plants, animals, and insects. And at a very alarming rate, they are being patented and released into our environment. A whole bunch of unnatural foods are being created that blur the conventional distinctions, like fish with tomato genes, or rice that is engineered to produce pig vaccines. Foods are being manufactured or en engineered with human genes. Now, is that acceptable, or does it recall cannibalism? Do vegetarians want potato fries with some fish genes in it? I know I go and look for garden burgers. Do I want my garden burger with the fish ketchup? What if the rice in your plate is contaminated with rice that is engineered to produce pig vaccines, to produce vaccines that would stop diarrhea and piglets? Now, that is very troubling, because it is impossible to segregate rice with pig vaccines from the normal rice. You cannot segregate it. Or food corn from corn that is engineered to produce drugs for pigs. Can you separate the two? Our past experience shows that these kind of engineered foods cannot be kept segregated and will ultimately will mix up in a food chain. We remember 2000 Starling corn controversy. Corn that was not meant for human consumption got into our food system, leading to the recall of how many, Rick? 500? 500 corn-based products almost? 300? It was like 300 corn-based products had to be recalled from Safeways and Albertsons. But do you know what? That recall did not take place from our food banks, from our soup kitchens. That recall did not take place from our food aid. So the poor people have no choice. Beggars cannot be choo you know, choosers. So our right to healthy, safe, nutritious food has been taken away from us. 
and that Starlink Corn did show up in corn products in Japan, in UK, in Canada, in other countries of Europe, as far as New Zealand. In August last year, the USDA announced that the US food supply has been contaminated by an unapproved variety of GE rice, Liberty Link, which was created by the Bayer Corporation. Now, this rice was last grown in small batches and small field trials in 2001. And five years later, it shows up in a food system. Similarly, unapproved GE rice from trial plots in China has showed up in the food system in Europe. And then, of course, there are the Bt crops. I mentioned Bt cotton before. Bt crops are basically crops that have the ability to produce toxins uh, within themselves that can kill the pest. So in India right now, you have Bt brinjal being created, um, Bt eggplants, Bt bindi, which is Bt okra, or Bt cabbage, Bt rice. So can you imagine or do you want to eat foods that contain genes that produce toxins? Do we want to eat pesticides? And they tell us this is safe, this is environmentally safe for us? Several studies have shown that GE foods pose serious risk to human beings, to domesticated animals, to wildlife, to the environment. We know that it is not like an oil spill that you can put a boom around it. They're constantly moving through air, through pollination, cross-pollination. The kind of biological contamination and pollution we are talking about, it can result in potential contamination of all non genetically engineered life forms with novel and possibly hazardous genetic material. You might remember the contamination of the native varieties of corn in Mexico. Corn which was sent to Mexico as food aid, genetically engineered corn that was sent to Mexico. There's several other concerns with this technology. One is public health. GE foods are not labeled in the United States. So it's not easy to trace the health effects of the consumption of these foods. But there are several studies that have been done by independent, which are independent peer-reviewed scientific research, which shows the health risks of consuming GE foods that range from allergic reactions to toxicity to antibiotic resistance to immune suppression to cancer. There are several studies that I can mention if you're really interested, and we can do it more uh, during the question answer time. But what I find really amazing is every time you challenge the industry, you are told, or when Zambia in 2000, when it said no to genetically modified food aid, we are always told you don't have to worry. Americans are eating it. But we all know this is like the largest guinea pig population. It's this vast experiment that is happening. It's happening on our children, on our bodies. And we tell the rest of the world it has gone through rigorous testing. You know what that rigorous testing looks like? It is less than 1% of the USDA research budget on biotechnology that is dedicated to risk assessment. Less than 1% of the USDA research budget on biotechnology goes to do risk assessment. This rigorous testing is all voluntarily done by the same corporations who are putting these products out there. And we are told it is safe. And then we are told, you don't have to worry because it is just like the other potato. GE potato is just like the other potato. And that is why I'm going to run to the patent office to get a patent on it because it's a new product. The hypocrisy of it, it's so obvious. And yes, they want to benefit the farmers. I didn't even mention the lawsuits. Monsanto is famous for sending letters, intimidating letters to farmers, threatening them because they think that they're planting or selling patented seed. Letters demand a specific amount, and Monsanto boasts about it that it settles usually out of court. So they claim that since 2000, they have settled for millions of dollars, and the farmers who refuse to give in, they have to face aggressive litigation from this evil company, if I could call it evil. And since 97, I believe, it has filed more than 90 lawsuits, 9-0 for GE patents and violations of technology agreements against 147 farmers and 39 small businesses and farm companies. This is how much they care for the farmers. And the letters are not just sent to farmers in the United States. I've seen those letters in Spanish being posted in Mexico's countryside. And we heard about insecticide use. I sh you know, shared the example from India and from China. But there's a study by the former head of the Board of Agriculture of the National Academy of Sciences who found that after the first nine years of GE crop usage, 
pesticide in use increased by 122 million pounds in the United States. The study also found that the farmers who are planting Monsanto's GE Roundup Ready herbicide resistant soy, they use two to five times more herbicides than their conventional counterparts. Where is our Congress? Where are the regulatory agencies? I mean, the interesting thing is around the Starlink controversy, it was the civil society that found that there has been a contamination of a food supply system. It was almost a month later that FDA acknowledged and said, yes, they screwed up, that there has been contamination of a food supply system. United States Congress has yet to pass a single law which is intended to manage GE crops responsibly. At the federal level, there are eight agencies who are trying to regulate genetically engineered crops and use, you know, regulate biotechnology. They're using 12 different laws that range from the time. Uh, you know, they were written long before GE foods, animal, and insects became a reality. So just how inefficient they are, uh, we all know perhaps about the current attempt by the FDA to regulate genetically engineered fish as new animal drugs. GE fish, they think of them as new animal drugs. And at the same time, FDA claims that it has no jurisdiction over genetically engineered pet fish, glow fish, you know, the fish that glows in the dark? Our kids want that, right? So there has been a complete abdication of any responsibility, of uh, any kind of legislative responsibility by our Congress, by our regulatory agencies, by our policymakers. And then we are told these crops are very safe. Let's look at the situation of farm insurance. Farm insurance companies in the United States do not currently offer coverage for damage due to genetic contamination. In fact, certain insurance companies have exclusions in their policies for claims arising from the presence of transgenic material. The leading five farm insurers in the United Kingdom have clearly stated that they will refuse to cover farmers who plant GE crops because they fear a public health disaster. So there is no insurance for these farmers who are going out there and uh, you know, growing these crops. And what about the loss of export markets? In the United States, the American Farm Bureau estimates that the American farmers or the corn growers, they have been losing $300 million per year because of the closure of the European markets since GE corn was introduced. It is estimated that the U.S. taxpayers have paid nearly $12 billion in subsidies to make up for the losses to the corn and soy growers. Most of our export markets have labeling laws. They have thresholds. They have restrictions on imports of GE foods and crops. You know, this constant threat of contamination requires careful testing, segregation, all kind of paperwork, which is increasing the cost for our farmers. So there is no economic rationale, there are no economic benefits for the U.S. farmers to be growing these crops. And even when you can force a country to, you know, get rid of its laws, which would allow these GE products to come in, consumers and retailers won't carry it. In 2003, a coalition of nearly 400 Japanese consumer and food industry groups that who are representing nearly a million consumers they declared that Japanese consumers will not buy wheat from the United States if it introduces GM wheat. So you cannot force the local populations, you cannot force the consumers, you cannot take away the democratic right of people to decide what they will eat. So I mentioned the ISA report at the beginning, but Greenpeace has just come out with a report which actually challenges this rosy picture that is painted by ISA. And it makes it very obvious that 2006 was another year of rejection for the GE crops. After eight years of massive cultivation of GE soil, Romania in Europe became the first country to take steps towards decontamination by banning cultivation of GE soil starting January 1, 2007. According to ISA, which is a nonprofit, by the way, Romania grows or it grew 125,000 hectares of GE soy in 2005. According to the Romanian government, they grew 87,000 hectares of GE soy. So who should we believe? I saw last year counted Iran among countries growing GMOs commercially. We know there's a lot of misinformation about Iran. But it turns out that Iran is neither currently growing uh, nor has it approved any GE crops at a commercial scale. So that's the kind of misinformation that is being put out there. Farmers from around the world, I mean, I was in India last year when Bharat Kisan Union 
set ablaze these field trials in Punjab and Haryana, these field trials of genetically engineered crops. In France, we know about Jose Bové and his colleagues who have been basically saying no to GE crops and destroying those uh, fields in the larger common good. The same is happening in the Philippines. In response to the bear rice contamination, over 40 farmers have sued the Bear Con Corporation for compensation. The Chinese Government Biosafety Committee has asked for further data and assessment on the safety of GE rice, so it has delayed the approval for another year at least. In Brazil, despite all the attempts of the industry to get GE corn approved, the regulatory body has delayed the approval. The GE regulatory body of South Africa has uh, rejected an application for the field trials of GE sorghum because of biosafety. The Supreme Court of India has placed a ban, a temporary ban, on all field trials of GMOs. Several provinces in the Philippines have declared themselves to be GE-free. In Europe, 172 regions have declared themselves to be GE-free. Andes has declared itself to be free of GM potatoes. They have admitted the GM cassava, which was going to bring wonders for Africa, has failed. Beginning in 2004, several counties in California, Mendocino, Marin, they passed laws that declared themselves to be GE-free, that prohibit the cultivation of GMOs, crops, and animals. And so what does the industry do? The industry gets very hassled, so they try to bring in the preemption bills, which will take away the ability of local authorities to govern how food is grown in their counties. So one such bill, preemption bill um, SB 1056, was introduced in June 2005. But this bill failed to pass in 2006 because of this groundswell of opposition from citizens, from public interest groups, from the legislators. A recent poll was done which shows 90% of Americans want their food labeled. 60% of them say if the food is labeled, they will reject it. And that is why the industry won't allow the labeling to happen. Where is the Congress? Are our policymakers listening? 90% of Americans want their food labeled. Kraft Foods, which is the second largest food producer in the world, has agreed to supply non-GE food to China. Rice traders of the two largest rice exporting countries, Vietnam and Thailand, they have signed an agreement which commits them to being GE free. It is not surprising that there are only four crops that are being commercially grown, which are genetically engineered. Look at the biodiversity that we have. You know, it's just corn, cotton, soy, canola. Papaya, it is, we know it's a confirmed economic failure in the, in, in the islands in Hawaii where it is being grown. In 2004, Monsanto halted plans to commercialize GE wheat because of our pressure. GE flaxseed has been taken off the market in 2001. GE sugar beet has been rejected by the U.S. sugar refiners. GE sweet corn has been rejected by Del Monte and others. So who can tell us that they're winning? Just this February 5th, you had a huge big victory. I mean, you know about bent grass in Oregon. A US federal district judge ruled that the previous uh, field trials were illegal, that they could not be done the kind of contamination that has happened. And in that context, when we see the newspapers and we hear about Gates and Rockefeller Foundation bringing a new green revolution for Africa, we have to stand up to it. We know that this technology has failed. The burden of proof is not on you and me to show that it is dangerous. The burden of proof is on the industry. Our evidence already shows that this is a failed formula for development, for eradication of hunger and poverty. We know that. So when Gates Foundation and Rockefeller Foundation pour $150 million to bring a new green revolution to Africa, when Mr. Gates puts out an op-ed and talks about, well, it might not be the only solution, but the genie is out of the bottle. We need to let them know that the opposition around the world, the grassroots movement, have put the genie back in the bottle. And we are tightening the screws in that bottle, and the genie is going to stay there. So, And that is really happening because of individuals. You know, this is about a food system. This is about something which is very personal. You know, it's not about the kind of car I'm going to drive. 
This is not about the kind of dress I'm going to wear. This is about food which goes right inside me. It could not be more personal. This is the food that you're going to give to your child that I'm going to give to my child. So this is very personal, and hey, it's very political. Every time we reach out to grab something from the market shelf, we are making a choice. We are making a choice about who grows it, who controls it, and what's put in it, and who gets to eat it. And we have a lot of power. Corporations have money. There's no denying. But what we have is our morality. What we have is us. What we have are the numbers. And what we have is this growing movement around the world. And what is really needed is an even stronger movement in the United States. There's nothing as powerful as fighting the battle in the belly of the beast. Americans have been duped for a very long time. I got some news for you. Your government thinks that you are a bunch of stupid idiots. Your government thinks that the farmers are idiots and they'll continue taking economic classes. And it's up to each one of us to take back our nation and to take back our food system and to take back the livelihoods of farmers and to let these corporations know that America is a democratic country. It is about government of the people, by the people, for the people, and not of the corporations, by the corporations, for the corporations. And that is only possible if all of us commit to joining Northwest Rage and the people who are in Portland. So thank you so much for having me here. In terms of just our food system, I would say that given what we know what has happened with uh, the mad cow disease, when we play around with the food system, what unsafe food systems can do, and right now you have a situation where regulatory agencies are, are saying without batting an eyelid that you know, cloned animals are safe. And it is just astonishing the kind of testing that, I mean, like what I mentioned, the kind of process that we have, and they can come out and tell the people that it's all safe. They'll take a big bite into it and then say, yeah, it's okay, I can eat it, so can you. So this is one of the biggest, um, you know, outrageous things that we have heard about that's in the news now, and we need to galvanize and, and act around it. As I said, this is about our food system. We cannot trust our regulatory agencies because we know that there's this whole revolving door policy between our regulatory agencies and the corporations. The people who used to work at the corporations then come and work at FDA, at USDA, when they've approved things that they want, then they go back to their you know, fancy cushion, well cushioned jobs in the corporate sector. There was an article in the paper just this morning about how one in every 150 kids that were being born was being born with autism, so this idea that the guinea pig experiment is working out fine. <laughs> it's maybe not true. Hey, I want to ask you um, if you could just elaborate a bit about, um, you mentioned about how some foods are infused with um, human genes. Um, I was wondering if you could just talk a bit about that. Well, there's a whole bunch of research that is happening. There's pharma crops. There's uh, in fact, we are about to put out a report by one of our fellows which looks at genetic engineering of a food system which had a lot to do with the pharmaceutical industry that we want, instead of food being something that feeds our families and communities, but it's going to turn into this big lab where we are cultivating different genes for humans and different, um, you know, it's like extra body parts kind of thinking that's going on. And uh, it's very interesting to see the relationship between Monsanto and Pfizer, for example. So there are lots of those experiments that are going on. They have tried to build support and investment for this technology by through the poor washing. We need it to feed the world. We need it to improve livelihoods of people. We need it to benefit the poor farmers. But at the end of it all, it's about further consolidation of our bodies and control over our bodies and of our food system in the hands of few corporations who see our agriculture and food not about communities, but as commodities. But this is really a, a growing movement. This is not about coming to here, Anuradha or whoever. This is about each one of us, whether we go to a synagogue or a mosque or our, our church. This is about family values, and we need to start talking about it, and we should be doing that. Um, also, I wanted to point out that Trader Joe's is one of the companies which says that all its products under Trader Joe's, they are free of GE products. And it is because of pressure and organizing that we have done 
as individuals. So it is time that we use our power. You know, First, when we go and spend our money, we need to ask our, uh, our you know, wh wherever you're shopping to demand. It's a right to demand that we have products that are free of genetically engineered uh, or GMOs in it. So start doing that. Very fun exercise that you can do, which I have done a few times. You know, take a big trolley, load it up with all kind of things. You go to the checkout. Please be very polite to the person at the checkout. I have worked there. I used to hate it when crabby people used to come by. But make sure, you know, you've gone through it, and then go to the store manager and say, sorry, I just discovered that your food has GMOs in it. So what they're doing is they have to take it all back, and they have just paid the person at the checkout. So fill up your trolley as much as you can. Use the dollar power. Use the dollar power. And the second thing, you will not believe when 10 handwritten letters go to the senators or to the Congress people. They get into a tizzy. 10 handwritten letters or 10 phone calls. Use your power. Democracy is not about voting. It starts the day after elections. Get them to be accountable. It is about our food system. So call your senators, call your congressional representatives, tell those policymakers that they are in temporary jobs, four years, and you're out. So listen to me now. I just had a question uh, about all these fields that have been contaminated uh, in the United States and the rest of the world. Um, how can these fields be restored, and is, are there any actions being taken to restore these fields? And how is the grassroots movement going in developing countries? Uh, you know, I mean, I think in face of people committing suicide, I think that there might be some grassroots movement, and I'm curious what's happening. To answer your question, in terms of contamination, as I mentioned, Romania is one country which grew GE soy for a very long time, and now it is actively working to decontaminate. Um, it takes several years, but they have started the process that they are growing soy, which is not genetically engineered now. And it will take a few years before it is completely decontaminated. Um, I don't have that information on me. Um, but Center for Food Safety, by the way, I also want to mention Center for Food Safety, which is a great group, which was one of the groups that was involved in the lawsuit around the bent grass. So I wanted to acknowledge them. Also, they have put out a book called Your Right to Know which is a great book because it also has a shopper's guide. So it's not just about everything bad and dismal and how 60% of the processed food has GMOs, but it also tells you how you can avoid it. So places like Center for Food Safety, I remember talking to Andy Kimbrell once, and there's this whole, I don't remember, or perhaps if anyone knows you, how many years does it really take for, a, for you know, people or field to be decontaminated? Um, but that information is that it's possible. I do remember that it's possible. It is time. It takes dedication. In terms of opposition, I mean, that's where the hope lies. I mean, I have been blown away. In fact, it's around the world. Like I said, 51 countries have regulations. Some countries have very comprehensive regulations around GE foods. Even countries, like I said, India. I mean, the Supreme Court puts a temporary ban. Most of the countries, like South Korea, Japan, the Philippines, most of the EU members, they have comprehensive regulations, even Australia, around GE foods. But what is most exciting is the grassroots movement. Yes, I do come from a country where the government has acknowledged that in the last decade, 150,000 farmers have taken their own lives. 150,000 farmers have taken their own lives. We do know that shit's hitting the fan. In this country, the number one cause of death among farmers is suicide something that we don't talk about. New York Times can have a story about farmer suicides in India, but they do not talk about the high rates of shame, depression, alcoholism, and suicides among farmers in the United States. So in the face of all that, you are seeing opposition growing. I mean, you know, all this is linked, genetic engineering, or whether it is our chemical inputs or trade agreements in agriculture, they're all symptoms of an industrialized agricultural system, where our family farms have been replaced by corporate farms, where our farmers have been replaced by machines, where our biodiversity has been replaced by monocultures. So in the face of all that, you see this opposition. And last July, World Trade Organization talks basically came to a standstill. And you know why? 
Indian Minister of Commerce, Mr. Kamal Nath, who is no great saint who would like to sell us all off if it were possible, but he knew that it would be so politically expensive for him to agree to a deal which was bad for the farmers of India that he walked out of the talk saying, hey, no deal is better than a bad deal because there were 500,000 farmers marching in the streets of Delhi. And as long as farmers don't give up hope, you and I cannot give up hope. Farmers are continuing to farm. In the United States, census does not recognize farming as a profession anymore. We have more people behind bars in this country than behind the wheel of a tractor. And yet, family farmers are continuing to fight the fight. And what we can do is join them. And that's what grassroots movement looks like.